Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Find Your Model Health podcast for those looking to optimize their long term health and weight goals and understand how their body really works. I am your host. I'm Shemaine Laney. I'm a nutritional therapist, integrative health practitioner, certified iridologist, and biohacker. And I'm very happy to have you back with me for another piece of your day. We have another special guest on to teach us all about our body and our health today. But before I introduce her, I must remind you that the information in these podcast episodes is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. Please consult your health practitioner before making any lifestyle changes. Okay, we have a great guest on today. So please help me welcome Dr. Deb Butler. Dr. Deb is a certified master weight loss and life coach and even taught at the life coach school for the amazing Brooke Castillo. Before that, she spent 30 years as a board certified chiropractor, nutritionist and acupuncturist, and she is the host of her own podcast, Thinner Peace in Menopause and Beyond and has been featured as a guest on many other podcasts and she's luckily blessing us with her time today so Deb welcome how are you today oh I am wonderful and happy to be here and happy to share information that you and I may know a lot of and I want to help inspire women in their 50s and beyond but of course below too Mm -hmm. about that life is just going to get better and I, I can already hear the women in the background saying, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, that's true. I've heard it myself. And, you know, I think um, our 50s, and I just kind of go into that age group, and it can be before, it can be a little bit after, when our bodies really start making some changes hormonally. And I think it's probably the most important transition of our lives. Now, I kind of equate it to adolescence in a way. Adolescence is a time of great turmoil in the body, but it's also a great turn, a time when you kind of decide like who you are and what you want to be and what you want to do in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think when you start hitting menopause, it becomes the same type of thing. It's a different type of hormonal change, but it is again, who am I and what do I want to do in the world? Except it's based on years of experience of which I call wisdom. Mm. And how can we use that wisdom at this age to connect better with ourselves? And I use food and eating Mm -hmm. as a way to do that. Not because I want to tell you what to eat, but because I want to help you understand if you're eating when you're not hungry or if you're gaining weight and you don't quite understand what's going on all of a sudden, that those two things have a lot in common and it has to do a lot with emotions. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are just not aware how they're tied together and how they can help us become the best that we can be more so than any other time in our lives. So let's start. Um, So I asked you to grace us with your presence so we could discuss menopause, the emotions around menopause, how women are feeling going through this chaos, this later adolescent time of chaos where we might have more (laughs) wisdom and more money, but it's still chaotic. That's Um, correct. And also, um, I had mentioned to you, hopefully we have time to discuss like why women don't show up for themselves at certain yeah. stages in their lives. So let's start first with um, menopause. Okay. What have you seen in your practice over the decades of the emotional turmoil and changes that women experience in menopause? Well, I think the main thing I mean, there are many things, but I'm I'm going to kind of look at the whole idea of uh, how we take care of ourselves, how we see ourselves, and then how we feed ourselves. 
And I work with women mostly who have been struggling with weight their whole life. And then mm. they hit menopause and now it's making it harder than ever. Mm. And I like that group of women because I don't, I, I think most of these women know what to eat and know what to do. As a chiropractor, when I was working with being very specific and telling people what to eat and what to do, there were many people who had the information mm -hmm. that couldn't do it or wouldn't do it or didn't know why they couldn't or wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And so that is who I concentrate on when now is if you're in menopause and you've been struggling with weight your whole life and it's making it harder than ever, why is that? Because it's nothing new. It's been going on. Mm -hmm. But like myself, I had a lot of tricks and tips that I used to use on how I could lose weight. And when I hit menopause, those tricks and tips didn't work anymore. And therefore, I just thought, well, I'm just going to have to give it all up. I'm just going to have to be fat. And there's nothing I can do. And I think that hopelessness is what I see a lot in women at this time is like, I've tried so hard for so long and now it's just way too hard. So it's more a mindset thing than a physiological thing. Well, I think it's both. Okay. And there are physiological things going on in the body. Let's face it. You and I both know that, mm -hmm. but I am talking about the mindset of whatever mindset you bring in to menopause it will get exaggerated. Mm -hmm. And if your mindset, if it was anything like mine, I just thought that all I had to do is eat certain foods and follow a diet and I could lose weight and that would be that and everything is happy. Ha ha. And what I learned is, and this is from a life coach that I learned this from, is she asked this simple question of why do you eat when you're not hungry? Now, I've been to Weight Watchers for years. Nobody ever asked me that question before. It was more like, just tell me what to eat. Tell me how much weight to, I, tell me how to do it so I can lose my weight and get on with my life. Getting on with my life, which means knowing how important nutrition is, eat junky food, as long as I wasn't gaining weight. Mm. And here I know all this information. And yet look what I would personally was doing, knowing what I knew. Yeah. And what I found for myself is that when I started looking at why do you eat when you're not hungry, it opened up a world to me of emotions mm -hmm. of why I was eating. Mm -hmm. And that journey that I went on is what I try to teach women to do now. I call it the thinner piece process, thinner piece, meaning being thin peacefully. And I think most of the people that I work with and if they're, and like myself, I had been thin many, many times, but I was never peaceful because I was always wondering what I was going to do when it came back on and how I was going to do it. And no, I, like I would look at other people and I would see them eating all of these non-nutritious foods and I would envy them because I thought like I would do that if I could. And I think a lot of women think like that. It's like, oh, she's thin, so she can eat. And why would do, why do we even want it? Why yeah. did I want it when I knew better? What was I looking for? Freedom? And, Happiness? Yeah, go ahead. Was, did you find in yourself when you looked at your emotions, what did you discover? That you were unhappy or you felt trapped or... What did you discover? I discovered, number one, that I used food for relaxation and enjoyment. That's what I discovered, the two things. And number three, as I, I was at a time in my life where I was also not as happy in my career. And so eating and going out and enjoying myself was a nice substitute for having to deal with where I was in my life and my career I should be happy. This should be good. And I wasn't, but it was easier for me to go out and celebrate than have to look at, well, what's going on there, Dr. Mm. Deb. Yeah. But I will tell you, looking at that and learn, like, how do you, can you actually go out without overeating or over drinking and have a good time? 
I ask this to myself. I think there's a lot of people that think like, oh my gosh, you know, how could I ever do that? What would people think? What would I think? Poor me. They can and I can't. And actually, it becomes a privilege when you know that you can eat whatever you want. You can drink whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But what do you want? If you're not trying to fill a hole, an emotional hole. I was trying to fill emotional holes of wanting something different in my life with alcohol and food. And it wasn't like it was a lot and it wasn't like it was a lot of weight. And I, it was just a way not to have to see what was going on. But I would just say, well, I, you know, I just like to eat. I love food. I love to cook. I have so many women that say that to me. Well, and, and I don't want to lose that. And you can love to cook and you can love to eat and you can take excellent care of yourself if you're not trying to fill emotions with food. Does that make sense? Do you think it all comes back to the idea of finding joy and chasing happiness? So I've, we, we both know that certain foods give us that dopamine hit and there's yes. a lot of research around the dopamine hit and addiction, not just in food, yes. but in drugs and gambling and the whole lot and it all Correct. seems to stand back to the dopamine hit so with the food and I, even for myself I'll use food yes. for a dopamine hit when I when I'm unhappy when something's stressing me not necessarily work when it's private stuff that's stressing me I'll use food yes. for it and I do enjoy baking and what I find with baking and like many other women I think it's that self that when, upon completion that sense of achievement that we yes. get and I think a lot of us as practitioners know that one of the pathways to happiness is achievement and making progress in our lives. Yes. So when women say, I love to eat and I love to bake, when we get granular about it, it's I love the dopamine hit because I'm so unhappy. And then I love the sense of achievement because I don't like the feeling of not making progress in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that with the, when we talk about this dopamine hit, it's, I, I mean, and I've heard on your podcast too, that you're not against eating these non-nutritious foods sometimes, no. and, and neither am I. It's just that how do you use them? What do, how do you use them? And I think I have this idea that there is a way to eat these foods that have no nutritional value that are enjoyable without going crazy, mm -hmm. without your brain going crazy, because I think you can be more mindful about it. And when you think you can eat something, as opposed to when you think you shouldn't be eating something, mm -hmm. I think when you think you shouldn't be eating something, and I don't know about you, but I hear from women over and over, I know I shouldn't be eating this. Or, or I've been out with women and smart women, and we're having this beautiful meal and the waiter comes out with a basket of bread and they very gently take the bread basket and keep passing it to the next woman and go, don't keep this next to me. You take it. Don't keep this next to me. And it's like, oh my God, these people are so smart and yet they don't trust themselves around a piece of bread. Mm. And I think that's where a lot of my work comes in is like, you can put bread next to you and you can decide if you want to eat it or not. When you start thinking that you can't trust yourself or you can't control yourself, I believe that about myself for many years, you won't be able to trust yourself and you will believe the food is the culprit. Mm. If the food's not the culprit, it's your brain mm. telling you things that you're believing about yourself. Mm. Yeah. I've spoken about trusting yourself with one of my groups a lot. Like, do you trust yourself to yes. make good decisions to show up yes. for yourself? So it's not yes. a case of um, what you're alluding to is it shouldn't be a case of quick, get it away from me because I can't have that in front of me. I'll just give in instead of that. It's a case of you can leave it there. I'm not going to touch it because I don't want it. Exactly. They're two very different types of self-discipline. Yes. And uh, two different ways of thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. One is I can't control myself and I don't trust myself. And the other is it's just bread. 
And, and, and when I'm working with women, those mindsets are available. Once they can see what they're thinking to begin with, it's not like they know they're, we know what we're thinking all the time. We just believe bread's a problem mm -hmm. and we need to get it away as opposed to, oh, my brain is the problem. Yeah. And I've been thinking this for so long that I don't question some of these things I'm saying to myself. Mm -hmm. And when you hit menopause with this type of mindset and emotions do get stronger, I'm sorry to say, but they do. Negative emotions get stronger, positive emotions get stronger, but everything gets stronger. If you've gone up to this point in time without recognizing these emotions and only know how to fill them with food, you will gain weight in menopause, regardless of what's going on otherwise. Mm. I know there's lots of other reasons why you can gain weight, but I am really talking about taking a mindset into menopause, the same mindset you've used before and using it and thinking that you can keep doing what you've been doing. If you've been filling emotions with food, you're going to want to fill those emotions more. There is no doubt about it. Do you think part of this, your focus may, and of course our focus right now is mainly around menopause. Do you think part of that is by the time you're halfway through life, for most people, 50 is going to be halfway through life. Uh, yes. Do you think at that stage, part of it is just wear and tear? You're just worn down of all the trials and tribulations of life. And it's just like, you're, you're, how would I even put this? You're just not as strong as you would have been in your early thirties because life takes its toll. I think I, I would answer that yes and no, mm -hmm. because I think as we go through life, especially before 50, I think a lot of us are trained to do things for other people and to do things because of other people and not do things that actually are good or helpful to us. Mm. And that feeling that you're talking about being kind of worn out, worn down, I think is more due to being in a life that's not completely yours. And I think that's an opportunity if you can become aware of that, that, okay, well, if this isn't the life that you want, what do you want? Mm -hmm. I mean, like to start thinking about it. And I love using food when people put food in their mouth, when they're not hungry to find out what's going on. So I'm more concerned with why you put food in your mouth when you're not hungry. I don't even care what the food is. Because I have a lot of people, and you, I'm sure you do too, that as long as you're eating nutritious food, it doesn't matter. And I'll have menopausal women say, well, I eat really healthy, but I'm gaining weight. If you're eating really healthy, beautiful, nutritious food, but you're overeating it, you're probably going to gain weight. I mean, you can't just eat nutritious food and never gain weight if you're not listening to the signals of your own body. And your, the signals of your own body, you have physiological things like hunger and fullness, but your emotions live in your body too. And they live pretty close to the feelings of when you're hungry and when you're full and when you're sad and when you're, all of those kind of live around the gut, at least for me, they do. Mm -hmm. and I think it's very confusing, tired, another one. A lot of us are tired and we confuse tired with hunger. And not aware. Mm -hmm. And I love bringing awareness to all of this. And I love it at this time because I think we're ready to go. Okay, this is going on my next half. What do I want? What do I want? And why am I, why am I afraid to get it? Or whatever it is. I just want to help people get what they want. Whatever it is. Or admit what they want. Now's the time. Do you have many people admit what they really want? I um, encourage people, even myself, I'm on a journey of discovering what I really want to yeah. be happy because happiness is the key to a long and healthy life. But mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a hard question for a lot of people. I think it is. 
I to agree. sit down and say, like, what do you really want? Like, and I emphasize the word really, like it's all yeah. high and fine to say, well, I want to win the lotto and live on an island yeah. off the south of Florida, which would be amazing. Yeah. But, <laughs> Maybe. but how long before I get bored there? Like really looking inward, like, is this really what I want? Does this make me happy? Do I find joy in my days? Like that's such a tough question for people. A lot of people are doing what they think they want right now so they can pay a mortgage and pay their car and maintain a life. But it, if you sat down and reflected, like, what do you really want? Then you have the follow-up question is, okay, if I was to go and do what I really wanted to be happy, how can I make money out of that to support my life as well? So it's a tough one. Well, I think it's what I deal with a lot. And I think because I deal so much with the mindset of what it is that you're thinking that's creating whatever it is that you're feeling and creating whatever it is that you're doing to be, to be aware of that, I think is really, really helpful because a lot of us do know, mm. I think. Yeah. And I think our bodies tell us a lot of what we know emotionally if we listen to it which is what I like to do with women is help them listen yeah. more to their bodies emotionally and physiologically. Our bodies talk to us. Yeah. Our bodies not only tell us when, like I start with the simple, are you hungry? Are you full? But once you get into that arena of, well, are you tired? Well, how tired do you have to be yeah. before it's time to go to sleep or rest? Or if you're in pain, how much pain do you have to have before you decide it's time to take care of it? And so I talk about becoming a body whisperer in menopause, meaning that instead of listening, instead of having your body scream at you to do something, you let your body whisper to you when it's time to do something, be it eating, be it sleeping, be it taking care of pain, there's low levels and they're high, they're high levels. As a chiropractor, I really worked with maintenance care, meaning trying to teach my patients that please don't come in when you're at a level 10 pain, if you can help it, because that's probably where they came in to begin with. Yeah. But to come in when the pain levels are lower, so much easier to take care of, mm -hmm. but you have to take the time to do it and believe it's important enough to do it when it's not screaming at you. And I think a lot of women become body screamers. They listen to their bodies. They push their bodies. When they're screaming is when we decide it's time to stop. And I don't think going past 50, that's the way you want to age. So it's the case of a pinch of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Ah, uh, perfectly said. So I have a question for you and yeah. I think it goes hand in hand. Like there are two points, but one question, if that makes Okay, sense. great. Uh-huh. So why do you think women, people, like both men and women, are yeah. so disconnected with their body now? I have so there's that, and it all comes into the one question. Uh so why do you think people are so disconnected? With what their body and feeling is now and then the second question is like where does society come into this like how we live nowadays with yeah. all the noise and then I'll, I'll after you answer I'll tell you what I think okay well I agree with you that I think we have a culture that is very influential on men and women, I'm going to speak mo mostly to women right now, because that's who I deal with. And, and that's who I help. But I think we have a society that speaks to us. And then I think that we have our inner self that speaks to us. And I think we're very connected to that inner self when we're a younger age, young, young. And I think through society and cultures and parenting and peers, we become culturized, so to speak, as to, well, this is what the culture wants from you. And some of us, many of us, end up be becoming so influenced that we forget 
we disconnect from who we are and what we want. Those emotions that live inside of us will tell us if we're listening or if we're trying to please an outside source. Mm -hmm. Are we trying to please an outside source, society, our culture, spouses, teachers, or are we trying to please an inside source, ourselves? Yeah. There's, a, I think there's so, it's like a tree. There's so many different branches to yes, this. Yeah. There's the trying to please other people, trying to keep up with the Joneses, trying to Correct. play catch up all the time, trying to just get stuff done, trying, I'm going to use the quote fingers, trying to take care of ourselves when yes. really, when I talk to clients and they tell me I'm trying to take care of myself, I'm like, but you're not, you think you are, but you're not. Mm -hmm. um, and the noise, there's so much going on in society. We have so many expectations, but there's so much yeah. noise that a big part of my work is structure with people so that I can help quiet in everything. If they know what time they're doing this and how they're doing this and mm -hmm. what they're doing before bed, what time are we eating? What does that look like? I, it's very much structured to create the silence. And that's not just with their day. We also work on the hormones so that we can give the person back the control basically because when you have control and this goes hand in hand with what you're saying when you have control you have control over your food choices not not in a case of I don't trust myself it's like I do trust myself I have control right. over myself I know what I want and I know what I want for myself outside food in the in the happiness realm of things um, and that's where I focus big a lot so much so I know my clients will laugh I annoy them. There must yeah. be a schedule. There must be structure because otherwise everything is haywire. It goes left, right, up, down. Like you have to have something in your day. You know, with a newborn baby, you have to know when that baby's going to bed, when it's napping, when it's feeding. Otherwise you get no time to yourself and nothing will get done. Right. And we know in, in early childhood, in childhood discipline that the more structure you give a child, the more, that's how, I mean, that's how you actually show love. Yeah. Is through discipline. In other words, we mm -hmm. don't let them do anything and everything they want and helter skelter, the more structured we are with them, the more comfortable and more loved they feel. Yeah. And I don't think that ever changes. And so I think what you're talking about is that's what we all need all the time. Yeah in order to feel loved by ourselves. It's, it, it's, I call it like, you know, it's like um, tough love with ourselves. It's like, mm -hmm. sometimes there's a donut sitting there and it looks good. And w when you indulge yourself, it's easy for your brain to say, oh, you know, you've been good all day and you should have that poor thing. You know, yeah, you've been, you've had a rough, or you've had a rough day. You deserve and, it. And you deserve it. And so therefore the donut goes in the mouth and tough love is how do you say no to yourself with love and not punishment? Because I think many of us, I just put myself in the category is we're all, we're, we punish ourselves so much and we take ourselves down so much. We make ourselves feel so bad. And then we wonder how come we use food to make ourselves feel better. Yeah. When, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, in what aspects yeah. do you see women punish themselves? Because I know someone out there is saying, well, me not giving myself the donut after a hard day, that's punishment in itself. But me and you right, obviously that... perceive it differently. Right. So once you realize, like, so I think part of what happens is like, I want to help women realize that they can eat whatever they want. I really want to create a mindset of you can eat whatever, I can eat whatever I want, you can eat whatever you want. I mean, you can eat donuts all day long if you want. Yeah. But what do you really, I, I think most, I mean, I think most people don't want that. Oh, you'd be sick. I think they the think dog. they do. I think they think, I yeah. think they think they want to be able to eat whatever they want and they envision something like that. But when it really comes down to it, 
It's you just want to believe that you can eat whatever you want, but you're probably, at least most of the people I work with really choose healthy fuel food most of the time because that's what they really do want. It's what does make them feel best. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, where do you put these non-nutritious foods in where it doesn't cause havoc with the body and it can be an enjoyable mindset feature, but it doesn't take over and it doesn't create such dopamine effects that you can't mindfully control it. Mm. And this comes back to why are women so unhappy in the first place? Um, well, I, you know, I, I think that's an interesting question, but I, I guess I would, I would say that I would say that a lot of it, I think has to do with somehow getting away from the idea that what we want and who we are and being that person is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we get that message. I think we get the message that there's something out there that you need to be and you should, you know, you should do this and you should do that. At least it was that way for me. I see it all the time. I'm sure you do too. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what if your big self your spiritual self, your higher self was running. What if she was in the driver's seat and the socialized self was in the passenger seat? Like, I, I don't think you don't want a socialized self. Mm -hmm. I think you can get along in this world having a social self. Yeah. I just don't think your social self should be the driver. And I think for a lot of us, our socialized self is the driver of our life and it doesn't make you happy because you don't feel it in your body. You yeah. feel something's wrong. Yeah. That's, um, it's very interesting the way you term that we have our social mm -hmm. self and we almost have our alter ego or childlike self that if yeah. it was me and you said, what do you want in that circumstance? It's like, we should do this. Well, I should work because I have to pay a mortgage and I have to keep a roof over it and I have to, have all these adult responsibilities but my childlike self says well no I don't want to do any of that I want to just be left alone to be happy and do what I want and I think a lot of people would relate to that but we can't we can't do that because we would probably all lose our houses and get in massive amount of debt so that's where I I do and I don't know if you agree but I believe societal expectations is a big part of why people are so unhappy oh and I agree every, and I can speak for myself and I'm not yeah. in men like I there's aspects of me and I'll be honest that are very unhappy and I don't like how society is and I don't like the demands it puts on me and the expectations um but it is the way it is now. So I'm not an unhappy person, but parts of, of me, if you said, yes. what do you want? I'll say, well, I'm unhappy doing this right now, to be honest, uh, not mm -hmm. this podcast, but I do think society plays a huge part. It's so confining for people. I think that's where my management comes in. It's I think you, I do a lot of coaching around this with people's mindsets about how, how they think and how they talk. And I think if you want to make money and you want to pay your mortgage, is there a way for you to be able to think about it or look at it in a way that will feel better than the way you're, you could talk about it? Because I think a lot of us really want to have the house that we're in. And if we do, then maybe we do, I mean, it's a way of changing the way that we think about what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And some of the thoughts that we have about where we're at in life aren't helpful. They're not going to help you. If you're, if you tell yourself, this is horrible and I can't do it, it's going to be very difficult for your mind to help you find something else because our brains are brilliant. Yeah. And our mind body connections are brilliant in terms of our emotions and our mind when they're worked together. Our minds can probably help us find anything if we can just point it in the direction of what we want. Mm -hmm. But if we're in a lot of misery, it's going to be very hard for our brains to see it because we're going to be pointing our brains in a more miserable 
we're going to point it to more misery. I don't know mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And no, just... I don't want to downplay those feelings. Yeah. I think they're real and I think they're there, but they, most of them are caused by how we think mm -hmm. and thoughts can be changed situations. Yeah. Not so much. They are what they are. You know, I, I talk about if the sky is blue, what do you think about that? Because that's, what's going to create a feeling for you. The mm -hmm. sky being blue, the sky is blue. There is nothing you can do about it in the moment. Yeah. How you think about it is everything. It's a great day. It's a horrible day. It's whatever you want to think. And you can do that with anything in your life. And I think good life coaching, being able to see the thoughts that people are thinking that are helping them. Yeah. And thoughts that aren't helping them and being able to help navigate that thinking and to do it, which is, I think what is so much fun about my work is I do it with food. What you put in your mouth when you're not hungry will tell you more things about yourself than you would ever guess. So looking time. inwards yeah. at your choices. And do you really want this? Like changing perspective and mindset. Like I think, mentioned. yes. I think that's a great way to look at a perspective and thinking, mm -hmm. perception. I think Marianne Williamson once said uh, that the definition of a miracle is a change in perception. Mm. It's when you can see something in a different way. And it's like when I changed from being a chiropractor to full-time life and weight coaching, that was not something that just was an easy transition and that I could just go, oh, yeah, I can just give this all up and go do that. Mm -hmm. It was like I had a lot of things about what you're talking about. It's like, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And it's like, as long as I was in that mindset, there was no way I could find anything. Yeah. And it's when I started um, getting coaching, helped me see that the only thing that really had to change is I had to, I had to be, have some way of creating hope for myself mm. that it could change. And that even though I was doing it for 30 years and it was very successful, I wasn't feeling it anymore. And if I wasn't, that, does, that means that I could find something else that's possible. Mm. And the way that I got into life coaching was basically that as a chiropractor, I could never stay on a schedule because I was so busy talking to people because I love to hear what people think. Yeah, I love it. And I think a lot of my healing came from that aspect more than body healing. And, you know, I segued, I did it kind of slowly, but boy, talk about lighting you up. Mm -hmm. I think when I became a chiropractor, it sounded good. And, uh, well, I don't know. I did it and my husband was doing it and it really looked good to a 26 year old. Let's put it that way. It was but by the time I was in my fifties, it was like, what am I doing? And I don't think I can do another back and uh, I'm good, but I'm going to have to do it. And um, what else would I do? And that kind of thinking and that kind of talking as opposed to if I can do this, what else can I do? There if must, I can start a business. Yeah. You must have had, I can only imagine, you must have had a lot of fear in that Lots transition. Of... Like, oh my God, I don't know anything else here. And this is my financial security. And like, I can almost feel like I'm going to abandon what I've been doing for 30 years and I'm going to do something else. Oh shit. <laughs> Just like that. That's it. <laughs> yeah. That was that. Yes. And I just... I, I had a point where I did not think that that was possible. I really believed that it wasn't possible. And if I didn't have help with my own mind management and coaching, I don't think I could have done it because I couldn't see mm. what was going on. I, I just believed it couldn't be done. Who yeah. would do that? Who would leave this? Yeah. Well, I would because I don't like it anymore. That's I'm why. Not, yeah. Period. Yeah. And I like this and I want to do this. And it's like, well, you can, I mean, like if you start thinking, well, you could do that as opposed to, well, you could never do that. And how could you do that? You've been doing this for 30 years. This 50 years is an opportunity because you know so much more about yourself if given the chance. Mm -hmm. 
if given the chance. Sometimes the way you're going to know yourself is you're just going to talk negative yourself and tell yourself you can't do anything else, or you're going to get some help and you're going to see that there is a whole world out there if we can help you change it in your own head. And we can use eating and losing weight to help you do that, not lose weight because you think not to make you happier, just because if you're not eating when you're not hungry, you're going to learn a lot about yourself and you're going to feel a whole lot better doing it. Mm -hmm. So just, if you don't mind back to your story, I'm just curious. Yes. I like hearing people's stories. It helps me learn yeah. upon reflection. Now, would you say you're happier now if you, yes, that yes. than you yes. were in Absolutely. your thirties and forties? Absolutely. Is that because Absolutely. you feel more free or you feel you're yes. making a difference or? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Okay. Everything, everything, everything. Mm -hmm. And it all started with the fear of not thinking I could do that. And the fear of why am I eating when I'm not hungry? <laughs> and it wasn't like it was that much weight, but it was that much of an opening of discovering things about myself mm -hmm. and how I talked to myself and how hard I was on myself, the way I talked to myself. It's like, I would never talk to anybody else the way I talked to myself. Mm -hmm. And that's not the self-love hard talk though. We're talking about just so people are sure. No, Cause like talking to yourself saying, Hey, go for that walk, whether or not you like it, you need to go for that walk. That's a different sort of, that's, our, that, that, yeah, that's, that's being on your own side. But when you're saying, let's say you don't go for your walk or you're going to, you should go for a walk and you start calling yourself terrible names and how you never do anything. And I would call that negative self-talk or punishment as a way of trying to get you to do something by being mean. And I think we don't do that, use those tactics on people that we love. Yeah. But I think we use those tactics on ourselves. I think we think we can be really mean to ourselves to get the job done because it's just us. But instead of it's just us, but it's, it's just sweet me. Mm. I love to call myself sweetheart and touch my heart and, and sweetheart, what do you want? And sweetheart, please don't talk like that to yourself. It's not nice. Mm -hmm. Compassion. Yeah. Self-compassion. What is that? Uh, people, we all know what compassion is, right? We all know about being compassionate with other people. But I think when it calls to self-compassion, it's like, what? Yeah. that A lot of people, there's a lot of words that go get thrown around the health space and the mild yes. mindfulness and people say it but I'm like what does that mean do you even know what that really means the self-compassion like what do you want like you said what do you really want for yourself because you can easily say what do I want well I want that donut and I want to watch a movie but Correct. what do you really want for yourself right I I, I agree with you and to be able to I think one is more what I would call self-indulgence, mm -hmm. indulging yourself with things that aren't going to help you. It's indulgence as opposed to um, compassion or self-compassion is how you would talk to yourself about not eating that donut. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my gosh, you feel so much better if you didn't eat it or you've been doing so well. And I know you think it's going to make you feel better, but it's actually just going to feel worse. Now, sometimes we don't have that space to be able to even consider it. Mm -hmm. But in teaching it and practicing it, we can get better at it. Mm -hmm. Just calling ourselves sweetheart instead of anything else would be a good start. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you really just think about it and those who are listening today, how do you talk to yourself? How do you feel when you're out and about? Like if you don't feel good inside your body, it's usually because you're talking to yourself in a way that's making yourself feel bad. It's like if you say to yourself, you know what? You're the best thing I've ever seen all day long and you're beautiful and I love you and you're using that kind of talk and you believe it, it's not going to make you feel bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't think many people talk like that to themselves. No. I think they talk like that to other people. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a practice to be able to look in the mirror and start practicing saying something nice. Mm -hmm. 
anything other than I don't know. I go in the mirror and go like this, <laughs> and as opposed to maybe just look in my eyes and go, "Hello, sweetheart," or give myself a wink. Just anything for a start that seems kind of nice. Yeah, instead just, of just let's go again on to the next task, like that, like mm -hmm. like just pause for a second and appreciate who you actually are because you are you at the end of the day you are you all the time <laughs> i don't know if you me. know um tom bilio he's um a great interviewer and podcaster and one of his one of the quotes he's most well known for is um he says the only thing that matters in life is how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself and oh, uh, god i, I love that I, yeah, I asked this on one of our Monday posts, maybe two weeks ago in one of my groups, um, this group, we're more of a tight knit kind of community group. So we have this uh -huh. relationship, I think <laughs> they're probably like, no, <laughs> but, um, uh -huh. very I'm much sure. honest, honesty, like, come on, this is a safe space. Let's be honest. How do you feel about yourself when you're by yourself? And mm -hmm. it was great to see all the comments. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I commented saying, I love spending time with myself. I think I'm hilarious. I'm like, I'm happy by myself. Um, mm -hmm. but this morning, cause I just got back from a week vacation this morning's like, yeah, I love being by myself. But after this vacation, not so happy with what I see in the mirror right now but it's and then putting it into Tom's quote is like okay well I'm not so happy with what I see in the mirror right now I did have a great time I don't regret it but what do I have to do now to get back to that 360 space of where I feel great I love being around me yeah I love that I mean I love it and I love the idea it's like even maybe something as simple as how can I take take better care of you today sweetheart mm -hmm. what do you need yeah you know, when you come back from vacation and you've had a great time and the first thing you want to do is not like what you see, you know, it's like almost like calm down. Yeah. It's okay. What can we do now? And, and also bring up something that's, it couldn't change that much in a week. I no. think that, but I think our, our brains, yeah. how we see ourselves, we don't see ourselves through our eyes. We see ourselves through our own brains and how we think. Mm -hmm. And it's very, depending on how you see, your, how you think about yourself is how you're going to see yourself. And so that's why it's so important to be, really work on your own thinking about yourself and the practice of looking at yourself so that you can at least move over a little bit to, well, you're not too bad would be a start as opposed to, oh my God. Hmm. I think more people um not to contradict you i think more people see themselves how they think other people see them they think do the same thing i'm not disagreeing with that but so, it's still their brains yeah so the it's very i i believe that had i not put that question to my group of people and it's a yeah. big group it's like 280 280 people like so it's a good kind of case study to get feedback on i think Very that if i hadn't put that question to people like how do you feel about yourself when you're by yourself they would have never thought of it people don't think of that question i love i love that question yeah and i think it really gives just to think about it will give a brain some perspective as to see what you even come up with so where are you right now yeah. Yeah. You know, and to see what you're thinking when you pose a question like that would be very interesting and probably was very interesting. Mm. So a lot of your work then is based around helping women understand where their mind is, their emotions are behind the choices that they're making and then helping them flip that almost 360. I would say yes. I think that's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. And to be able to use this transitional time as a springboard. It, there's a lot of spring right now going, I mean, mm -hmm. there's springing. It doesn't feel like it, but there is. There's opportunities mm -hmm. going on right now, transitionally for a woman that doesn't happen very often. And we can look at it as, oh no, or we can look at it as, oh boy, this is going to be, this is going to be something. Yeah. And now that I'm way past that, 
I, I would say that what I would say to anybody in their 50s is if you do this work, the best is yet to come and be prepared to be more surprised than you could ever imagine mm -hmm. of what you're going to create and what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And I, I, being out of it, I can say I have been surprised. It's better than I could have imagined. And you can have the same thing. Yeah. And this is an opportunity. This time is the opportunity. Sometimes the negative challenges would seem negative. The challenges are opportunities to grow. And I think there's some big opportunities at this time to do some growth around your connection to yourself. You know, what's working, what's not working? Mm -hmm. What do you want? What's not in your life that you do want? And I think you're right that it's a difficult question. And a lot of people don't even know how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're working with somebody who's good at that, and you're willing to be coached and open up to it, there's a lot for you to learn about yourself mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah. I do hear or see in in social media and whatnot a lot of women comment that once they passed their 50s they almost had their second life their kids had grown up now was their chance to really focus on themselves and back to the happiness find their happiness travel like they had freedom um per se i think that's it, true i think it's true i think it's a perception and i think it's a really that's the way i would want to be thinking yeah and it's like when my son went off to college, I had, I, I thought, oh, this is not going to be any big deal. I couldn't move. I couldn't get out of bed for weeks. Mm. And it was, that was a surprise, but you know, there are changes and I had to deal with the feelings that I had before I could move on to this amazing life that is in front of me. But there are things that happen that you have to deal with. And it's, you know, you for me, I spent a long time raising that kid. Yeah. I put a lot of time and energy into it. And it, when it, it was kind of coming to an end, my body said, what's going on here? Oh, I know. Yeah. And it took me a minute and it probably takes a lot of people a minute, but oh, on the other side of this, if you're willing to explore, is to create the best is yet to come because I really do believe it's a coming and we're the creators of that. Mm. And that's not being afraid of change. Your teen is gone. You're in menopause. Everything's changing. Oh my God. To a lot of women, it is that, oh my God aspect. And I do have a lot that's of right. clients who have cried when their kids have gone off yes, to uni yes. and saying goodbye on the plane and whatnot. Yes. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when my little boy does it. Cause he's like, me and him are almost one. We're like yep. just one person. Yep. Um, should be. But there, there's hope with change as well. And that's what I think we're giving people today in this conversation, that there is hope. It's not all doom so much and doom. Hope. Yeah. That's right. There are some negative challenges and there are some negative emotions that are going to be here to help you if you're willing to be helped. See it yourself, get help, whatever it is. There are opportunities galore. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing that we can depend on is change. That's the only thing that we can depend on yeah as much as we might so, not want to <laughs> well um it's it's it, you know the uh, cause of suffering is when you don't like what's going on mm -hmm. yeah when you don't like what's happening like and all of us would like to ha like what what's happening all the time we would like life to give us everything we want all the time and nothing bad ever happened but the truth of the matter is is that learning how to be with life, negative and positive, is how you grow strong. Mm -hmm. And when you realize the change happens and that you can handle it. You may not like it. You may not want it all the time. But sometimes in perspective, 
it could be the best thing that ever happened. You just mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah. Uh, how many, how be... many times do we say that? Like exactly. upon reflection, it was upon the best reflection. thing that ever happened, but in the upon, moment yes. it was tough as hell. That's correct. And that's the way I, and I think that that kind of stuff is there for a reason, that intensity, because it gets our attention mm. yeah. and it's there. It needs our attention. Right. If we're not happy or we're having negative emotions and it's strong, that needs our attention. We don't want to push it away. We want to mm -hmm. we want to bring it right up, welcome it and work through it. And I, I'm not saying I think that's easy, but I think that you don't want to push it away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this has been a great conversation. I do yeah. think we've given women a lot of hope. Um, your story in itself is fascinating because it's more familiar than people realize. So I wanted to, uh, if we had time, uh, like I mentioned, I do have a pressing question that's always on my mind. And I try to ask as many specialists as I can because it, it bugs me. Like it, it oh, okay. gets to me a lot. It upsets me when I see women doing so well and showing up for themselves and then they just stop. And I can't understand why. And I know there's personality traits as well. And I think mm -hmm. part of why I can't understand it so much is because I'm so highly driven and like mm -hmm. I get laser focused and I, regardless of my story, I think that's part of it. But I, I, I want to get to the bottom of it. Maybe there's a book in here somewhere at some stage. Yeah, why do like women... It stop showing up for themselves when they had been doing so well in the first place well I, I, I it's like if you would give me an example of what you mean by that like of not sh like be showing well, up for we'll go to the not... food and the nutrition aspect because okay. that's what we both specialize in yeah um, so a woman can be so consistent for, let's yeah. say eight weeks and she'll be yes. 20 pounds down and she'll be feeling wonderful. And she'll be like, my clothes are better. My skin hair, I have so much energy, like all the good stuff. And mm -hmm. then you see it slowly starts to pitter away and she starts to go quiet and she stops showing up for herself yes. and asking for what happens there. Something happens there. And yes. I know in some cases, someone will message me and they'll say, look, we had a death in the family or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. But in other cases, it's just the loss of motivation or something. I can't understand it. Well, I tell my clients to plan on it because I think it's going to happen, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to weight. And I, I think that this is the reason why we are here in people's lives is mm -hmm. I, I call it like how to come back. And when you can learn how to come back mm -hmm. after something like that, you do strengthen a muscle that may not be very strong mm -hmm. of what you mean, like giving up on yourself. Cause yeah. I don't think that they see it as giving up on themselves. I think they see it as, you know, if you've spent years struggling with your weight and you start getting this weight off, but you've been using food your whole life, it almost becomes like, isn't it time to reward myself a little bit here? Mm. And I think those behaviors are very, very important to coach, probably more important than losing the first 20 pounds, because there is this thing that goes on where you're motivated and you're working and you lose the weight. And then I do a lot of work with the scale. Because I think the numbers on the scale create all kinds of thinking in your mind. And when you're used to using food for reward, I don't think you're going to get through weight loss without wanting to do it at some point in time. And having somebody to guide you when it comes up and get you through it and get mm -hmm. you to come back. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you're going to come back just one time. I think it's going to happen. It's going to happen a lot. I'm not going to say a lot, but it's going to happen because it's the way your brain's been trained to work with food. It's hard to get away from food not being a reward. Yeah. So it's not like I think they think they're letting themselves down. I think they think at some deep level, they deserve it for all the hard work. It's like, I've done all this hard work and I've lost all this weight. So now don't you think I should be able to eat? Mm. And working that concept 
is a way to make sure that you could have permanent weight loss to be able to go through that a few times, mm -hmm. bring yourself back. And then you start getting to know your brain better. And those neuro old neural pathways, those are old neural pathways is wow, you've been so good. Isn't it time? Yeah. For a treaty treat, <laughs> something, something. Mm -hmm. And it's usually not a walk in the park, but over time, it can become, it's like being there for yourself and really rewarding yourself. After you see this pattern a few times, you can start creating new neural pathways of what does reward mean mm -hmm. that maybe it's not food. And I'm not saying you can't use it at all. It's just, you can't use it, especially when you're losing weight, use it as a reward because you start gaining weight again. Yeah. And then you start thinking terrible things about yourself again, but it is a process. And I think most people go through it. It is a journey and I get tired just thinking about it. It's I, a journey. I lost, um, for you don't know, my followers will know, I lost 165 pounds. I've been at my goal weight since 2008, which is a long time. And That's just time. listening to you talk about the process, even though I'm in it and I do it and I never stopped. I'm like, this is exhausting, but there's, to me, there's no alternative. There's no other way. Like I will never go back, but it's some days you're like, I just needed a day off, a little diet break, a little bit of fun, but I can get myself back on track yes. fast. But uh, that's where the other people that, that causes me to have this internal struggle of understanding, like, yes, we can have what we want in an, for the evening or for one day. But then we need to get you back on plan or come back. I, we, I just say back on track as ASAP, like the next day, like that mm -hmm. there's, there's so much work to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, that, um, to try to find ways, I try to teach ways of how you can, uh, have a, more non-nutritious food, but keep it more mindful still. So, you know, I have a hunger scale that we use and from a negative 10 to a plus 10 is negative 10 is starving and a plus 10 is full. And I talk about eating between the two and mostly fuel food. But I think when you can get to the point that you could fit in a non-nutritious food, but not have to overeat it, like not like when your brain stops going, well, as long as we started, let's just keep going mm -hmm. as opposed to like, we can just enjoy this and still stop. I mean, I think that's something that can be trained to, I'm not saying it's going to happen all the time, but I'm sure for you that you have figured out a way how to incorporate that. Yeah. And for many of my clients, and that goes back to the, I'm sure. we have structure, we have guidelines, we have rules. We have one of each. I don't, uh -huh. guidelines and rules are not the same because I hear a lot of practitioners saying we don't have rules around food. We have guidelines. I have guidelines and I have rules. Like some of the rules like are that. sucralose, MSG, like we're watching out. Those are no foods because they will mess you up. But mm -hmm. um, a lot of the like guidelines are like this is going to be better for you this does this this and this but I have the tree I have structure I have guidelines and then I have like rules like you can do it if you want but our rule is don't do it because it's going to mess you up and usually people love it. will experience the repercussions and then they'll say sometimes I have to laugh they'll say well I did what you said I shouldn't do and I was up all night vomiting and I'm like well I suppose it's the lesson learned, isn't it? You won't do that again. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. And then it even makes more sense. I mean, sometimes that's how you learn, right? That's you. A child puts his hand in the fire. It hurts. You won't do that again. So that's yeah. true. There that's has true. to be like back to the branch, although there's all these, there's a, a negative tree, a dark tree that has everything stacked against us. There's another tree that's a bright tree and there's loads of different branches and we should use everything. We shouldn't just say yeah. you can't have this or you there are rules or I don't use rules. There, everything, everything plays a part if you know how to utilize everything. I love that. I just <laughs> love that.
That's wonderful. Well, this has been awesome. This has been a great conversation. Yeah, I know I threw you some curveballs. So um, where can people find out more about you and what you're doing and get you some followers your way? Uh, my website, drdebbutler.com is my website and Dr. Deb Butler, Facebook and Instagram. And also I offer free consultations or mini sessions which is drdebbutler.com forward slash work with me as a way of finding out if we would be a good fit or if I think that I could help them. Um, I don't just let, I, I'm not hired over the internet because I want to know who I'm working with and if I can help them. So this is the way that we can learn is we can actually have a conversation together. And I think we'll both know. Yeah. If this is a good fit or not, if the thinner piece process will get you what you want. So we, uh, I will put all the links in Perfect. the description, but for those of you that don't go looking at the links, you can go to Deb's website and you can see the work with me option there. If you want to do a consultation. That's correct. That's great. great. That's great. And again, you have your own podcast, Thinner Peace, as well. If people want to go check that out, uh, I definitely will be checking that out. So um, the podcast world is is growing fast. Yes, so it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today. This was very enjoyable. I really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it as much myself. It was, I, I have chills all over from all the things that I've learned from you. <laughs> well, thank you for your time and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.